Today is March 14th, the fourth Sunday in Lent. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Father in heaven, rich in mercy, by the humiliation of your Son, you lifted up this fallen world and rescued us from the hopelessness of death. Lead us into your radiance, that all our deeds may reflect your love. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from John. Jesus said, Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light, and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we have a very interesting text today uh, from, from the Gospel of John, and there's a lot of things going on in this short reading, and, and one of the things that, um, well, of course, one of the things that's happened in this reading is we have like one of the most popular verses in the Bible shows up here, uh, John three sixteen for God so loved the world, and, and then you know, we kind of hear a little bit of the context uh, that centers or that that uh, is centered in, and then there's very quickly a lot of talk about condemnation, and uh, and belief. And the the way that that this reading comes to us kind of separated from from the larger reading because of course the Gospel of John was intended for us to read the entire thing at one time, uh, and for a variety of reasons, we don't really do that anymore. So uh, I think one of the first things we needed to do is put this all in its larger context. Uh, for one, this talkness about light and darkness is is about exposure. Uh, that That's really all it's about. I've talked before about uh, darkness is not automatically the bad guy in, in these biblical narratives. It is something which people can use to hide what they're doing. That's that's kind of John's take on it. It it this is about exposure because of course darkness was present with God as as God uh began creation. Uh it's not that that darkness is a, an alternate god or anything uh, it's it's more like one of the early perhaps spiritual powers, uh, darkness and chaos, water even in in the uh, first chapter of Genesis are are kind of already there, and uh, and so the again these are things in which uh, other entities can then enter into to obscure what they're doing. I, I think that's what John is saying. And and that that's kind of what's going on about this uh, b belief and lack of belief uh, that's then connected to it, that, that that people hide in this. The reason why this is going on is the larger context that this comes in is that this is 
part of Nicodemus's first visit uh, to Jesus, and he does it at night. It's in darkness, it, Nick at night. Um, Nicodemus comes to Jesus the first time in darkness, and there's a lot of misunderstanding. He's not certain about what's going on. This, this reference the, is all just the first step in a much longer process. Because Nicodemus is going to show up two more times. I think I mentioned this before. Nicodemus will show up two more times in John's narrative. And the more often he shows up in the narrative, the, the brighter things are, the more exposed things are. And they'll finally... Uh, he appears with Joseph of Arimathea to bury Jesus, and he's carrying a hundred pounds of spices. It's clearly exposed that he is a disciple, even though the first time he comes in darkness. And so there are ways in which sometimes Christians read these texts about it's a moment where you make a decision, and that determines your relationship with God. That's clearly not the intent in the overall context that we see this passage appear in. It's a process for Nicodemus. It starts in obscurity and darkness. He's hiding. And then gradually it grows into obviousness. Uh, there's, there's another context, of course, in this reading about the serpent being lifted up. Um, and uh, that's an interesting passage. I'm going to try to remember to, to link that in the description for the video uh it's a quirky passage it seems very strange uh poisonous snakes have come they've bitten the israelites uh, because they became impatient about uh, god's plan to redeem them to rescue them and to get them to the promised land uh, they're complaining about what god is supplying to them uh, and so these uh, poisonous serpents, or some translations probably more accurately, I think, say fiery serpents come uh, and, and bite them. And then they're like, oh, okay, maybe we shouldn't be complaining. And uh, so God tells Moses to put this bronze, uh, fiery, ser uh, a bronze version of fiery serpent on a, on a pole and to lift it up. And whoever looks to that uh, will will be healed from these fiery serpents. Uh, I say fiery serpent is, is more accurate. I, I think some people translate it as poisonous because that's the experience of, of poison as a burning sensation typically. And, uh, but it says fiery and that's important because that could mean more of a spiritual power rather than like actual snakes that God sent actual snakes, that, that this is more of a, a spiritual thing because fiery serpent is seraphim. That, that's the word, which is, that's an angel, the spiritual being. So this may be describing more of a, um, a spiritual situation rather than just like a, a, an angry God who said, oh, you, you don't like what I'm doing, so I'm going to beat you up with snakes, you know. And uh, I... I think then what Jesus is appealing to is the fact that something is going to be lifted up uh, that will rescue the people from this spiritual obscurity that they find themselves in. And of course, this isn't, it's, it's not just that this is the first time in John's gospel that you get Nicodemus. It's also kind of one of the first references to the cross. We'll get another one. It's also to, uh, talking about Jesus being lifted up. Uh, and so there's this kind of progression in John's gospel also about this liberating power uh, of, of Christ being lifted up on the cross uh, as, as a way to rescue us, for, of God obtaining victory over uh, spiritual forces that s seek to lower us into a kind of faith obscurity. And... And, and that we see that unfolding in Nicodemus. We see that unfolding uh, in descriptions of the cross in John's gospel. I think the next big one is like in chapter 12. And then, of course, the actual crucifixion, uh, which is after that, uh, Nicodemus shows up a fully exposed. Uh, you know, he's not hiding the fact that he's a, a disciple anymore. Um, 
hundred pounds of spices, right? So that's kind of this this uh, the work of God's redeeming of God's people uh, from this spiritual obscurity that they find in their lives. Um, it's the the numbers text, which is where it talks about the Israelites with the, the fiery serpents uh, and their impatience. I think now that we've been in this pandemic for a year, uh, there is a temptation for us to be impatient about uh, how we ought to respond uh, as church, how we ought to move forward. And I, I encourage us to not become impatient to, to, and it's not just impatient. I like, I'm impatient. I, I would like things to get back to a, a renewed and better normal, I hope. Um, but I'm, I'm, I am ready to be done with this. But what I don't want us to do is then to get trapped in the kind of spiritual obscurity that that can bring. Like, I think it's okay for us to be impatient about the the, the thing that's going on, I think it's different than being impatient with God. Um, and, and we, of course, have access uh, to the, the full exposure, the full revelation of the cross to give us the strength and power to continue. To begin now, that especially now that we can kind of see the end, that we've had this, we're, we're at the one-year anniversary, it's a time of reflection again, that we can recommit ourselves to look at the cross, to the, you know, our, uh, our thing that's lifted up before us, you know, rather, rather than the fiery serpent, it's our, the symbol of our redemption lifted up before us. And to begin to imagine what the future could hold in ways that will be more life-giving, more profound, and more liberating than what we came out of and certainly what we've come through. Uh, that, that we can, what I like to call a prophetic imagination, an, an imagination that sees God's liberating and life-giving uh, actions at work in the world. And I think that that is a time for us to um, to look to those signs of God's redemption and to hold on to that, uh, that those are graciously given to us freely, not that that we're having to make a decision right now about whether or not we will be in a, 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 a positive or that we, that we have our, our act together before God. It's not that that's not what what John is talking or Jesus is talking about in John's gospel uh, in this reading, but rather to engage in that process that Nicodemus himself is going through of going out of obscurity uh, and into uh, the obviousness of, of following Christ. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Father, you sent your Son that the world might be saved through him. Inspire the witness of the church throughout the world. Empower missionaries, Bible translators, and ministries of service in your name. Bless our partners in ministry, our ELCA Global Partner Churches, and the young adults in Global Mission. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. From east to west, your steadfast love is shown. Nourish seas and deserts, wilderness areas and cities. Give water to thirsty lands. Nurture spring growth that feeds hungry creatures. Bless farmers as they prepare for the growing season. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You sustain your people in the wilderness. Give courage to all who lead in times of crisis and scarce resources. Prosper the work of those who aid victims of famine and drought, and bring peace in places where scarce resources cause violence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Your mercy endures forever, O Lord. 
Deliver all who cry to you, especially those who are hungry or without homes. Give life in places where death seems triumphant. Give healing to those who are sick and comfort to those who mourn. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. By grace, we have been saved. Fill us all to overflowing with that grace so that we show mercy to others. Nourish any in our midst who are hungry and bless our ministries of feeding and shelter. Give us patience and courage when the way seems long. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear now, O Lord, those prayers of concern and of thanksgiving which we now lift before you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Your Son was lifted up so that whoever believes might have eternal life. We praise you for all who have died in Christ. Bring us with all the saints into the fullness of your promises. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else you see that we need, Grant us, Father, for the sake of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless us now and forever. Amen. Go forth into the world, serve God with gladness, be of good courage. Render no one evil for evil, strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the afflicted, honor all people, love and serve God rejoicing in the gift of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. Amen. Mm -hmm.